Hello and welcome to this webinar hosted by Flow. My name is Elizabeth France and I'm Flow's Director of Legal Services and Public Affairs and I will be moderating today's session. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone for joining us uh, for today's discussion titled How Fast is Fast Enough? DC Fast Charging Deployments for Cities and Utilities. Before we hear from our speakers, I'll just go over uh, a, quick, a few quick housekeeping matters. Today's session is being recorded for future use and will be available on our website in the coming weeks. All attendees are muted so our speakers are not interrupted. However, questions may be asked at any time by using the chat function, and we'll do our best to answer those in the Q&A section at the end of the webinar. Let's now turn to the topic at hand. As the transition to electric vehicles continues and accelerates, the infrastructure necessary to support that transition will change with the needs of consumers. Today, we're going to discuss both the current state of DC fast charging and what the future of this technology might look like. We have three guests today who have significant knowledge and expertise in this area, and we're extremely fortunate to have them joining us. Our first guest today is Michael Leland. Mike is the Innovative In Initiatives Manager at Fortis BC. Mike, can I ask you to tell our audience about Fortis BC and uh, your role within the utility? You betcha. Um, slide up there, perfect. So good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Mike Leyland, Manager of Innovative Initiatives um, for both our gas and electric divisions at Fortis BC. I won't bore everybody with the text on the screen, but I did want to just give a bit of context into uh, who Fortis BC is. So we serve both natural gas and electric customers in British Columbia, up in Canada. Collectively, we serve about 1.2 million customers or uh, just over a million customers on the gas side and just under 180,000 customers on the electric side. Our electric service territory is in the southern interior of the province and you can kind of see it in that green slash yellow shaded area there. And um, that's what we're gonna be talking about here today. Next slide, please. Real quick here, we've got a map of our current DC fast charging deployments and planned deployments through the end of this year. So today we have 23 fast charging stations in service um, across 16 sites in 14 communities and an additional 16 stations planned for deployment before the end of this year. And I know we're gonna talk a little bit, a little bit more about this during the presentation, so I'll, I'll save the rest. Um, I guess back to you, Elizabeth. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, our next guest is Carl Popham, and he is the Manager of Electric Vehicles and Emerging Technologies at Austin Energy in Texas. Welcome, Carl, and uh, perhaps I'll let you tell our audience a bit more about Austin Energy and how you came to be involved with uh, EV charging in Austin. Uh, certainly. Um, so hello, everyone. Carl Popham. Uh, a little bit about Austin Energy. Austin Energy is the third largest city-owned electric utility in the United States. Uh, we service uh, Austin, Texas and some surrounding areas, which accounts for about a million folks and quite a few uh, businesses and some industrial. Um, how I got involved in the EV space was uh, in 2011, we, co we founded a team called Electric Vehicles and Emerging Technology. So I got to uh, be the first and current manager of that team. Uh, and so for my one slide, anytime I'm given one slide, I'm just going to show you that the people actually make <laughs> make the magic happen as much as we can here at Austin Energy. So so there, there's my team. Uh, today we're focusing on DC Fast. Uh, we do have over 30 EV programs uh, in the portfolio, a pretty wide range, everything from grid integration, low income programs, uh, quite a few. Uh, but in the DC Fast, we do have an active uh, DC Fast deployment, uh, as well as uh, DC Fast is part of our our uh, electrification bus electrification of our local transit authority, Cap Metro. And, and glad to be here with you. Thanks so much, Carl. Lastly, we have Jeff Dion, who is the director of product line management at Flow. Jeff oversees the DC fast charging in initiatives at the company and uh, I'll turn it over to Jeff to tell us a little bit uh, more about his role and flow. Thanks Elizabeth. Uh, so yeah, so as introduced, I'm uh, Jeff Zion. Uh, we're looking our solution at Flow, our product solution, specialized for the DC uh, product line, which we call our smart DC. Uh, we're now at our third generation of uh, smart DCs uh, with Flow. So we now have uh, above 700 units that were delivered uh, 
of BC type all across Canada uh, and some in the US too. So uh, here to talk about the, the errors we made, the good, the good thing we learned and uh, in general good practices that are very good uh, to share with you and hope to have a very constructive discussion with Mike and uh, Carl. Great, thanks very much, Jeff. Um, I'm gonna jump right into our discussion then. And uh, the first question is gonna be for Mike. Um, Mike, you touched on this a little bit uh, in the intro, but can you tell us a bit about uh, Fortis's DCFC deployments? Um, you started on this, how many units do you have? What variety? Um, what kind of sites are they deployed at? And, and what were you really hoping to achieve with uh, that deployment? Sure. So, yeah, as mentioned already, we've got 23 50 kilowatt uh, DCFCs in service today, um, 16 individual sites. So we do have a number of dual station sites and we've got we've got sites in about 14 communities across our service territory or just about every major community that we serve. The stations are typically hosted by the local municipalities. So they have provided land um, at no cost to the utility. They provide general site maintenance and Fortis BC really is responsible for the capital investment as well as the long-term ownership and operation of the stations. We've worked hard with our municipal partners to locate the sites you know, in close proximity to provincial highway corridors um, as well as amenities for drivers to visit while waiting for a charge. And I'd say that amenity piece and, and, and trying to drive some traffic to local businesses was really part of the value proposition for the site hosts and, and the request from us for land at no cost. You know, we're, we're hoping everybody's going to benefit not only through transportation electrification, but, you know, also folks coming to some of these communities where they might not have visited before and, uh, and hopefully spending a few dollars. We do operate predominantly in a rural area. Um, so our intent with the public DCFC deployments was, was really to kind of establish that base network of highway grade charging infrastructure across the service area to give both customers and prospective EV adopters the confidence that they would be able to travel throughout the service territory without experiencing that dreaded phenomenon that we all call range anxiety. Um, added to that, our provincial government has established some fairly aggressive targets for decarbonizing light duty vehicles. This includes a zero emission vehicle mandate that will see 100% of all new light duty sales be zero emission vehicles by 2040. So with those objectives in mind, before we made any of these investments, um, it was pretty clear we had a lot of work to do to begin laying the groundwork to support customer adoption of electric vehicles. That's, that's great, Mike. Very helpful and, and descriptive of Fortis's activities. Just wanted to ask you a quick follow up and, and it sort of goes to sort of lessons learned and best practices, mm. but um, do you feel that you've achieved what you were hoping to with the project thus far or, or can you provide any, any insights to people who are considering these deployments? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, the, the project has, has really come to an end. Um, it's, 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 we've, we've moved out of those initial deployments. I'd say we're a bit more focused on operationalizing the network now, but I think you know, the initial objectives, like I said, about establishing that base uh, network of highway grade charging infrastructure, we've definitely accomplished that. You know, we've covered the service territory such that customers are generally within 50 to 65 kilometers or 30 to 40 miles of a DCFC site um, with them, like I said, in almost all major communities that we serve. So I'd say, you know, that, that question of range anxiety, frankly, um, has quickly been replaced by congestion anxiety as we've seen adoption grow in our service territory. And, and that congestion anxiety actually is a key consideration was behind our decision to uh, double up and densify some of our existing sites here. I think we're all familiar with the pain of waiting five minutes at a gas pump and, and just kind of the impatience that can come with that. Um, you know, the experience of waiting a half hour to an hour uh, potentially to access a, a DC fast charging station is, is just a terrible customer experience. And the stories that folks are going to tell, is, it's not going to help support customer adoption of electric vehicles. So I think we've got a lot more work in front of us to do. Um, I think the topic we're talking about here today is very timely. You know, how fast is fast enough with, with kind of those concerns in mind. But, you know, our initial, like I said, our initial objectives, yes, we've definitely accomplished them. Great. Thanks very much. Um... Carl, I'm going to turn to you now uh, and sort of extend the same question. Um, given that your deployment is more urban than rural, I'm curious to see how to, to hear about how your DCFC deployment differs from or is similar to the one uh, detailed uh, by Mike, sort of if you can just paint a picture of what that 
DCFC ecosystem looks like and um, what you were hoping to achieve in, in your deployment? Well, there's definitely some similarities. Uh, so our business model is to work with hosts to provide land at no cost to the utility and we provide an amenity. Uh, to include one of our hosts is the city's transportation department in the right of way uh, and a sustainability showcase called Electric Drive. Um, so we just deployed uh, five DC Fast hubs. Each hub has four each, so 20 DC Fast over the last few weeks as part of a state of Texas grant. Uh, previously that we've had two different DC Fast pilots. So our first DC Fast pilot was about six years ago and we learned everything not to do and how everything can go wrong and just really how problematic first generational DC Fast is. And I've already seen huge leap and leaps and bounds you know, from the five years around reliability customer experience, uh, footprint, and even just how it looks. And how it looks is important because it's part of your marketing campaign, those DC Fast. I mean, the first ones out there look like two big refrigerators taped together and a very faded screen in the Texas sun that people couldn't read and it was just bad. Uh, so then our second pilot was part, as part of our uh, showcase called Electric Drive. If you Google Electric Drive Austin, Texas, you can see it and you can see the solar powered kiosk with it and whatnot and do a little a virtual walk of that way. We also have a virtuality tour and some other things. And what we learned, so that was the next generation. And the thing we were most interested there is dual standard. And I think that's one thing that's very important to us. As a public utility, we just don't want to support Chatamo, for example, Nissan Leafs, et cetera. We just don't want to support CCS or, or Tesla. We want universal standards. And so we were one of the first to deploy some dual standard technology, and that was leaps and bounds better. And now we're deploying out of this like the latest uh, dual standard technology uh, that probably addresses some potential reliability issues, especially in a hot climate like Texas. Maybe y'all don't need to need to worry about it as much. Um, and I would say uh, overall, we're still in a, in a learning phase without a doubt. Uh, we just recently deployed the 20 DC Fast. We'll have 30 deployed in about six months just to kind of round out the portfolio. Uh, we're doing transition to production plans. We're setting up all the different types of uh, SLAs around it. So um, yeah, our, our journey is uh, in full blown mode. Uh, most of our lessons learned in infrastructure has been uh, managing now almost 1,000 level two. So we know all the background and we know, you know, we have the pricing and the business models and the stakeholders around that uh, as we really kind of go uh, all out at DC Fast. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And just on a side note, you know, on the poll, thanks everyone for doing that poll. Uh, I was surprised one, one person said signage was very important to them. Uh, out of the 30 or so voted. So however that is, I kind of want to know who that is. I just had a meeting this morning about new signage for DC Fast with our marketing team. So maybe you can be part of my, my focus group on the importance of signage for you. That's great. Thank you, Carl. And that will be uh, just a good little segue. And I, I can give uh, our audience a quick update on where we are at with our poll. The question was, what factors would be most important to you in using a DC fast charging station? And, and people were invited to choose as many as they like. We had 68% for speed, 36% for price, 68% for location, 55% for availability, 23% for ease of use, 5% that one person for signage, and 50% uh, <laughs> for uh, reliable performance. So thanks, thanks to everyone for participating in that poll. Um, Jeff, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to direct the next uh, question to you. Uh, Carl and Mike have given us um, some examples of DCFC deployments in, in both rural and urban environments. And you mentioned that Flow has deployed over 700 DCFCs across North America. And so I'm just curious if uh, the examples laid out here are consistent um, with your experience in deploying DCFC infrastructure. Yeah, sure. And yeah, they are consistent. And what, what I like about the example that we're given is, uh, for example, Mike is not in a purely uh, corridor, highway corridor installation uh, in his, in his uh, type of, of territory. And Mike and Carl is closer to, to, uh, to downtown Austin, so more of a suburb and, and downtown approach. So that, that brings kind of new realities to the development deployment of DC. So yeah, the first uh, sites that come to mind are those highway corridors between two large city uh, people going from CDA to CDB. But 
to, to tackle that, that first level of range anxiety. But as those sites are mostly covered now, new challenges emerge. Uh, so I would say that the one was very well explained by Mike is there's there's a need for more chargers on these sites. There's a, there's a conjection there. So we need to improve the experience and make sure that we accelerate them. And we also make sure that there's enough for all that, that transit. But the second part is more about uh, regional coverage. We need to expand more than just CDA to CDB. People don't go always from in straight line. There's a lot of different roads that we take. Uh, and if you want to make sure that we promote the EV adoption and, and it's viable for everyone, it's also covering those, uh, those uh, smaller communities, not just only to bring people from the city to those small communities, but also helping them uh, adopt the EV locally as the, the DC charger is really a key part of... Uh, of the the, the, the the charging infrastructure. And uh, for these sites, uh, the, the business case is not as trivial as it can be maybe on a, on a highway. Uh, we need to find a better balance, a right sizing between, between all the different aspects uh, that are mentioned here in your poll. So uh, I think it's uh, it's very important to to also attack these, this next challenge. And uh, as an example, we have the city of Kingston that is located just next to uh, one of uh, Canada's largest uh, highway corridor between Toronto and Montreal. Uh, when it came time to install their DC charger, they decided to uh, not go for just straight next to the highway, but maybe just bring it <clears throat> closer to their downtown area so it would contribute into their uh, local economy and it made much more sense in their uh, overall analysis of the DC uh, charging deployment. That's very helpful. Thanks, Jeff. And um, you sort of touched on a word that I wanted to, to bring up in, in the next question, and that's the concept of right sizing, uh, a word that we've uh, heard a little bit more in the industry recently. I'm wondering if you can just uh, tell us a bit about what, what that concept is and, and how it's being used. Certainly, it's really about striking the, the right balance between all the different stakeholders. So in an installation, you have, of course, the network, you have the drivers that need to be, uh, uh, that have some needs, but there's a site owners and there's a utility that are part of the mix. And each of them needs to have the, the right benefits to their case uh, so that the, the, the DC site is not only viable when it's deployed, but it's viable a long time and that all those different stakeholders will be interested to make it uh, alive for a long period of time. So the 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 site owner, if uh, the cost of acquisition and, of course, the cost of operation are way too big, uh, there's no way you can find a, an attractive way of uh, partnering this with its local business or local community. Uh, for the utility, uh, too big of a site might trigger some uh, extra uh, upgrade of their, their grid. And the connection point might be a tricky one because it could be in the middle more mostly of, of nowhere where uh, there's not a lot of services. Uh, so they clear, clearly have a voice that we need to hear uh, in, a, in a DC deployment. Uh, and finally, the EV driver, they need to get that, that much uh, needed energy for that to address that, that range anxiety and make sure that they can get back on the road and attend uh, their normal trip. So it's finding that, that right balance and uh, not thinking that it's a one-size-fits-all solution. It's really a, a right-side custom-fit solution for every uh, deployment that we do with the right actors and partners. Thanks, Jeff. That's that's very helpful, and and perhaps I'll I'll ask Mike and Carl to weigh in as well on on their experience uh, about right sizing and and how how sort of right sizing that concept might play into them choosing their fast charger solutions. And and Michael, I'll, I'll start with you if you wanted to give us your thoughts. Sure. So I, yeah, I think right sizing it's got meaning you know both in terms of the uh, station output, um, but also in terms of the actual installed utility capacity for a given site. And, you know, we are currently looking at deploying higher powered chargers on our network. Um, we know the 50 kilowatt chargers are not adequate, frankly, for the next generation of EVs that are starting to come to market with larger batteries and the ability to benefit from higher charge rates. But I think, you know, still reliability is of fundamental importance. Uh, I mean, the, the poll results, you know, speed was for, first and foremost, location, um, but availability and reliability. I think are, are, are somewhat similar, frankly. Um, you know, a, a station that's down is, is still unavailable, right? Whether, whether or not it's congested. So that's really a key focus for us as we, as we look at what's coming to market here for higher powered chargers. You know, an ultra fast charger is no good if it's out of service, you know, once a week or something like that, so. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you, uh, Mike. Carl, do you have any thoughts on how you guys have been uh, incorporating the concept of right sizing or if that's that's played a role at all in your deployments and solution 
Well, without a doubt, and to look at a bigger picture, in Austin at least, and pretty much nationally, uh, about 80-85% of all charging happens at home. There's no public infrastructure required. It's behind a customer meter. About half of that is done through a level one or an outlet, which generally requires no additional cost from the customer. And then the other half is a level two. They want more juice at, at home. So that is an ideal solution from a utility perspective. The natural um, curve is there's a lot done at night, especially level one that has a trickle curve at night. Here in Texas, we have a 15 minute market, ERCOT market. A lot of times we have overcapacity at wind at night. So we have a new load that is sucking up, vacuuming up all that potential excess, very, very low cost, zero emission energy at night. But looking at fast is very, DC fast is very important part of the portfolio. So the key is to have a diversity in your fleet. And so what we're looking to accomplish with DC fast and right sizing to us is, so the stations we put in, uh, start at 62.5, but can go up to 125 kW if no one's standing right next to you plugging in. So there's a load balancing there uh, up to 125 K. So the, the value of load balancing is if, if this, the site isn't being maxed out to capacity, you're still controlling uh, demand charge and other kind of capacity cost requirements by having an electronic load balancing. But if no one is else there, you can go 125 if they're all fully loaded it's still a respectable 62.5 draw um, and it's really down to really two factors cost and emissions we want to maintain cost competitive with gasoline if every single person had to charge on dc fast we wouldn't we wouldn't get there uh, to put it in perspective a level one outlet is generally free if you're installing a new one all in 100 bucks level two a public facing one here in austin all in is about $4,000 a port, and that, that it's an industrial grade one. And then our DC fast all installed can be 60, 70, 80,000. So, you know, at some point you're, you're, you're transferring it as utility, you're transferring those costs back to that customer. And so if all you need to get a drink of water and then I pull up a fire department with a fire hose and hose you down, that's expensive and probably not, not what you're needing. So our ideal right sizing is just enough based on your vehicle miles traveled, how long you naturally want to be parked there and what's the business case you're trying to do. So DC Fast for us is about high VMT applications, electrifying taxis, corridor traffic, multifamily access who might not have other ways to go, gig economy drivers, those type of Thanks, Carl. It's very helpful. Um, that's a, a perfect segue into to the question I wanted to put to Jeff next about um, sort of high uh, powered chargers. And um, from a technological perspective, we've seen announcements in the industry for charging stations as big as 300 or 350 uh, kilowatts. And sort of a question as product line director at Flow, um, are these increasingly large stations the future of DC fast charging? And um, what challenges and opportunities do these types of high powered stations present? Yeah, they're, they're, it's, it's impressive to, to begin with, but it's, it's uh, as explained a little bit by Carl, it, it's, it, it's not aligned with our right sizing explanation. Basically, it, it might make sense for very, very specific side, but overall, it'll be hard to manage. Uh, it, it kind of pulls the blanket too much on one side. So increasing the, bow, the, the power of those sites will bring uh, a big impact on the utility, as, as mentioned. So whether it's, it's upgrade costs or just operating costs, uh, and uh, it kind of uh, upset the advantage uh, advantages of, uh, of EV driving. And uh, on the other side, if, if the site owner is buying those stations, it's a, a big upfront cost of acquisition, but also on the operating cost, uh, the capability to go very high on one charge in a month can can be really make it uh, kind of non-viable on the long term. And if, uh, if at the end we, th we think that we can pass those charges to the EV driver, well, then it becomes repulsive and it kind of counter uh, it is counterproductive to the idea of uh, easing the uh, the adoption for the EV drivers. So uh, we want to make sure that we're competitive with, with gas, as mentioned by uh, by Carl. Uh, we want to make sure that we still have that right balance for all those stakeholders. And uh, it, it still uh, incorporates in a complete ecosystem that includes uh, charging at home, charging at the workplace, charging on the curbside and the DC. So it's finding that right balance in the DC part, but also in type of DC deployment in, in all of those technology. Thank you. That's that's very helpful. Um, 
I want to just change tracks a little bit and um, put this next question to Carl. And it, it, it's an issue that comes up often in terms of, of um, DCFC deployments and future proofing. And so um, just a question about how you folks in Texas sort of um, make sure that your DCFC deployments are, are future proof and um, how you ensure that technology that you're using today um, will still be up to date in three years time. That's a good question. I mean, there's two components to it. There's the infrastructure that leads to the DC FAS and the DC FATS itself. Let's talk about the infrastructure, uh, what the utility works on. Uh, anytime we lay DC FAS, anytime you trench a site, anytime you're pulling up concrete, you really want to, one of the cheapest things you can do is lay enough conduit. So if you start adding stations or later want to increase the stations, uh, you're not you're not having to retrench again, especially in public right of ways. There's issues with that and just cost and time and closing streets and all those kind of things. So you kind of have one chance to kind of get into that street, in my opinion. Uh, even on your transformers, uh, usually DC fast is ground mounted transformers uh, here in Texas, um, and it's so and generally it's more efficient to kind of uh, oversize those for a little bit of growth. So once again, you're not. So you're kind of laying the groundwork, and this is also part of the strategy of just. EV readiness in, in buildings, but I, but I digress a little bit. Uh, as far as the technology itself, I'm um, very hopeful we get more to an open standards uh, based world in DC Fast. I mean, even the charging standards, our global standards kind of failed us a little bit. That the fact we have CCS, uh, Chatamo, and then the Tesla standard, um, at least the level two is pretty universally accepted. Um, but I think that will just make it easier for kind of upgrading, uh, if, if, if you will. Uh, but right now, um, the systems we're putting in, we are doing it to be consistent with our existing 1000 level two charging ports. So we have a consistent customer experience, but, uh, I don't think it's necessarily open standards or might not be the, the best solution. It might be. Um, but I think, um, we still have a ways to go to really future proof the technology itself standards would be a big, big driver for that. That's, that's great. Thanks, Carl. Um, Mike, I'm going to turn to you for a moment. Um, we sort of looked at this from, from consumers in terms of what's important to them in, in DC fast charging when we sent out that poll, but um, from the perspective of Fordist, uh, what's important to you when it comes to your uh, DC fast charging stations and how do things like uh, reliability and uptime cost and service rate in your uh, pr procurement process? So I'd, I'd say all of those are, are very key considerations in the procurement process. Um, I, I don't think I can understate the importance of reliability and, and you know, the impact that ultimately has on customer experience. So you know, above all else, reliability has, has been one of the key things we've looked at. You know, Fortis BC uh, was fortunate. We did benefit um, in the province of BC uh, by having BC Hydro, our, our, our crown corp that, that operates the electric grid for much of the province. They were the go-first utility for us here and, you know, made a number of deployments um, in the 2012 to 2015 timeframe. Uh, um, reliability was a, was a really big challenge for them, operationalizing the network, making sure stations were, were up and when they were down, trying to manage customer expectations. And, you know, I think it, it, it didn't serve adoption well. Um, not a lot of good stories came out of that. And then, you know, those, those stories don't go away quickly. So we were certainly focused on reliability when we began, began our deployments, um, you know, talking to other utilities who had used our vendor. And, I, you know, above all, I'd say the partnership we have today um, with that vendor um, and their commitment behind their product and, and, and the network it operates on has just been fundamental to providing that best customer experience. Um, some of the other considerations, you know, Carl had mentioned um, the open standards question and that, you know, with respect, you know, especially to network management protocols is, is a, a real big thing right now. The whole, the whole conversation around OCPP and, and concern around potential for stranded assets. And, you know, I think there are, are some valid concerns there for sure. Um, Given the newness of the market, though, and, and you know, some of the, the challenges we've had with um, some of the, the initial hardware, there, there does seem to be some benefit with some of the vertically integrated models like the charge points and, and the flows right now. From a stranded asset perspective, you know, my concern has not been uh, about the station necessarily. You know, we, we know they've probably got 
at most a 10 year life. They'll probably be obsolete before that and replaced with something else. Um, the real concern is the sites we're picking and the amount of capital we're investing in, in terms of utility capacity and all the civil works and, and future proofing, like Carl mentioned, you know, that, that hasn't burned us yet, but certainly has potential to if, if you um, do a poor job on, on site selection or you don't have a strong partnership with your site host. I think that's, that's a, a equally important consideration, you know, in as much as the, uh, the overall procurement process is for the stations themselves. Um, but yeah, again, like I said, reliability, that, that's fundamental to us for sure. Thanks, Mike. And, and, and Carl, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to, to weigh in on anything else. I know you, you chatted a little bit about open standards and, and some of the, the work that's involved, but just curious if um, there's anything specific that Austin Energy sort of looks for when it's choosing their um, DC fast charging hardware or software solution. If uh, there's anything else you want to mention, um, it'd be great. Well, I think it's important to reemphasize reliability. There is a big disconnect of what's happening now in DC Fast, how long an outage lasts, and what a customer expectation is. We've seen focus groups, a customer might accept a DC Fast being down about an hour or so. An average DC Fast outage is generally measured eventually in days right now until the market's getting a little bit better. So, uh, so not just reliability, but service level agreements, uh, especially if you're getting more of a premium uh, warranty or any kind of as a service or outsourcing support and then how you're tracking those metrics are very important to us. Um, software providers like to track uh, uptime and percentages so one of the more popular has a 98 percent uh, reliability. Utilities talk in terms of safety and safety so that's outage duration and the outage frequency. So what would be interesting is if you're going into a utility, utility market, you need to be able to kind of compare the two and then you need to be able to comfortably talk between the two. Of what does 98% mean to a safety and safety metric is what utility measure typically their reliability. Um, so that really is key. Uh, dual standards important for us. I just don't want to put out one, one kind. I just don't want to support our Chatamo drivers or, or CCS. Um, and uh, ultimately, we also like in Austin, you know, we're a city on utility, but we really like to encourage third party businesses who want to do EV charging, whether it's DC fast or level two model, what and come in and then we can just do what we do and provide electric service, uh, reliable electric service at low cost to your site. And then you can set up uh, DC fast charging hubs as well. So we're very um, keen for that business model. As looking at DC Fast, we don't have to be the sole provider or do it all <laughs> in Austin Energy. And, and real, real quick, Elizabeth, if I could just add to that the um, the importance of trying to stimulate private investment. I, I, I think that is another key objective here. Um, you know, Fortis BC was one of the first uh, utilities, at least in Western Canada, to have a regulated tariff rate for service to drivers. Um, so today we charge nine dollars per half hour for use of our fifty kilowatt stations. You know, parity with gasoline definitely is a key consideration. I think it's, you know, looking at the procurement process and your questions around cost, like the cost of the hardware, that's that's obviously a key factor and in into the rates you're ultimately going to charge for recovery from customers. But I, I do think it is important to have somewhat cost-based rates to, to send that price signal both to drivers, but also to potential private investment that once we hit that critical mass, there is going to be a viable market for, you know, other players to come in here and, and provide those services like Carl mentioned. That's great, Mike. And um, in a moment, I think we'll we'll uh, get into some questions. And I think we've got some questions about rates, so it'll be really helpful to sure. to chat further on that. Um, Jeff, just to to sort of wrap up the the formal portion of our session before we move to the Q and A, um, can you give us some final thoughts on what the the future of DC fast charging looks like uh, from your vantage point at Flow? Well, I think future is very exciting. Uh, a lot of synergy from the the the, the speech of Carl, uh, Mike, and what we see. Uh, the 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 same topic came back uh, in a lot of different uh, conversations. So, of course, uh, balancing the speed, but clearly the availability and the reliability of the station should be up there, uh, as they are. Uh, mission critical element, the DC charger. Uh, I think that maintaining them, yes, sometimes 
they will fail, but bringing them back to service is probably uh, even more important uh, at the end of the day. And it's having a local team, uh, having uh, hotlines, having ways of repairing these uh, either remotely through uh, over the air services or having uh, really crews that are trained on the product and capable of repairing on the spot. Uh, and at the end, I think it's regional coverage. If you want to make sure that EV adoption is, is uh, on all territories, not only in urban areas, but also in smaller communities, it's having the right solution at the right place. And that's why the 50 kilowatt for us is still a very interesting one, especially when the, it, the, the sites are more emerging. And 100 kilowatt, as uh, mentioned, can be uh, more suited where uh, there's new uh, long range battery vehicles and a little bit more traffic and you need to uh, to get those vehicles qu more quickly on the road because uh, there's still a big difference between the fully adver advertised power of the car and what they, 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 they get in, in real life situation. That's, that's great. Thank you, Jeff. And I think it gives uh, our audience a real insight into um, different deployments and, and, and different configurations of, of DC fast charging and, it, and what it's going to look like going forward. Um, we've got uh, a few questions, time for a few questions, and I'm hoping that our uh, panelists will be up for those. I mentioned one about rates and um, there's a uh, Carl, I'm not sure if you're able to see um, in our in our chat. I'll read this one out, and um, and and then perhaps we can have sort of a, a more general discussion about rates. Uh, Mike, I'm sure you have some some thoughts on on pricing for DC fast charging. Um, this specific one was for Carl, and said, um, given the breadth of experience you've had with charging capacity at very various use case locations. Have you been able to determine how much charging price elasticity there is between 50 kilowatt and 150 kilowatt DCFC experiences? Is price more determined by congestion and location? So our most popular stations, um, when we talk first about the level two network is workplace charging as far as public stations. The calculus is this, the typical car, at least in Texas, is parked 95% of the time. It's only on the road 5% of the time, and 1% of the time, according to this study, is looking for a parking spot. So you look at where a car is naturally going to be parked. A car is naturally going to be parked at home or at work. And capturing that at-home work market is kind of the key if you really want to get high usage, and we do heat maps on that. So for DC fast, we um, all our stations are the same speed right now, anywhere between 62.5 and 150. So we don't have a premium that you know will unlock and you can get up to that 125 if you pay a little more. Uh, it's really more about you know how much your car can accept and then how many people are at that particular hub. Um, part of our grant requirements was to also support corridor traffic, so we tried to say pretty close to I-35, which is a, which is a major, major <laughs> corridor here in the US. Uh, but we also wanted to support about five business cases per site, uh, anything with high VMT, electrifying gig economy drivers, TNC, et cetera. So currently our pricing is a pilot pricing right now, um, but it will be moving you know, at some point to market pricing. So it's part of our 417 unlimited fill up plan that includes the 1000 mostly level two charging ports. But as we roll out and pilot the DC fast, they're included in that. Um, so it's interesting data, how people react to it, as long as they're a member. If you're not a member, it's 21 cents a minute. And we, we, we picture us moving to 21 cents a minute for everyone, but it's good data for us to get with our customers and also kind of kickstart uh, the program. So that was a very long answer to reading your question to say, no, I do not know. <laughs> and then I put some filler in there. It's what we call pivot. Those are those are it, it, those are always helpful answers, Carl. So thank you for that uh, additional detail. It's always helpful to hear from from people who are, are running the stations what uh, what they're doing. Mike, um, I wonder if I could ask you to jump in and, and talk any uh, about the rates that you guys are charging for sure. your DC fast chargers. So we're we're in a bit of a unique situation. Um, given that we have rates, um, which works out to about 30 cents a minute, just, just to compare Canadian. So sounds, sounds close to about 21 cents US. Um, our our uh, counterpart utility, BC Hydro, um, has, has quite a number of deployments across the province. Um, and they don't currently have a rate 
for service. So they're, they're effectively free. So that, that really is kind of the market we're competing against right now. And I'd say customers, you know, have not been terribly receptive. You know, there's some fairly critical feedback on, on, uh, on plug share. Um, and we've heard it directly from some of our customers. And so there, there's a bit of an education process. I think the other challenge we're having right now is um, we're not able to bill on energy or capacity. There's, there's some regulatory considerations in Canada around weights and measures. And so time-based rates are, are kind of the default. We don't really have an option. There's a lot of good reasons to have time-based rates, but I think a flat time-based rate from zero kilowatts up to 50, 100, you know, you, you, you really do need tiered pricing, um, kind of similar to what we're seeing Electrify America and Electrify Canada roll out there. I know, Personally, hearing from some drivers, you know, with older EVs, degraded batteries, um, or even just depending what state of charge they have when they roll into a station, they're they are feeling somewhat penalized when they're when they're paying that rate and maybe only peaking at 25 kilowatts. You know, they'll do the math on on what that energy costs them, and, and oh my gosh, it was a dollar a kilowatt hour. And, and granted, there's there's a whole explanation why that comparison with what your retail rates at home really isn't the appropriate one, but you know, we are focused on implementing tier pricing at some point here. And I think kind of the, the logical tiers from my perspective right now are zero to 25, 25 to 75, and, and probably 75 to 100 or 150, whatever our kind of next generation of station is going to be. Um, we haven't done any consultation yet around that. We're just getting ready to start that and, and, uh, and hopefully engage some focus groups and, and get a bit of customer feedback. Um, but I think generally, uh, some of the other studies I've looked at, you know, uh, tiered pricing has been very well received and, and kind of strikes that right balance between, like I said, the older vehicles and, and the folks who maybe can't take advantage of the, the full 125 kilowatts on a CP250, um, while also providing, you know, if, if a customer is able to benefit, um, making sure they're paying, you know, whatever the appropriate cost is. That's very helpful, Mike. And we just had sort of a follow-up question from from one of uh, our audience members that that agrees that free uh, charging is uh, difficult. <laughs> well, and, and no, nothing's <laughs> free ultimately. Somebody's <laughs> paying for it, right? So again, I, I, this kind of circles back to trying to stimulate private investment, send the price signal, because you know, from our perspective, we're we're not we're not looking to be the dominant charging network in our service territory, right? Establish that base network, but hopefully, private investment's going to step in and. And really let the utility get back to what our core business is, poles, wires, substations, you know, providing safe, reliable electricity. Um, we do produce some of our own energy. We do own some hydroelectric generating plants. Um, the, the balance of our supply really is under a long-term power purchase contract with BC Hydro, though. Yeah, and, and it's important rates also drive customer behavior. If you're giving something away, I mean, ideally, we want people who, our ultimate goal is people charge at home behind the meter, like we kind of talked earlier. And so, but if you do need a DC fast, we want it available for you. And we want a rate that encourages you to get on and get off, get on and get off so you can recycle it. So that's why we like the per minute. And on the also flip side for third party investment is we also make sure our rates, if you, if someone third party wants to do charging, they have very competitive rates. So their business model works for them. So by default, we have very competitive rates here in, in Austin Energy. I'm happy to kind of compete uh, on that model as needed especially when we have businesses coming in from California and whatnot. Um, but also we are developing a specific tariff. If your sole purpose is you're providing electricity for EV charging, uh, we're looking at a very interesting kind of tariff rate. So you can now have multiple choices as a DC fast provider or as an EV charging provider in our territory that might align uh, to once again, get that infrastructure investment in. Thanks, Carl. That's great. Um, we are just nearing the end of our time here. I wonder if our panelists have time for, for one last question before we sign off. You betcha. Sure. Speed round. Sure. <laughs> um, perhaps we'll, we'll um, take one more question, and this one is about uh, demand charges. That is, is sometimes a, a uh, a hot topic when it comes to DC fast charging. And so I see a question here about, um, are you providing site hosts a demand charge holiday to spur high power charging or, or how is that working? Uh, maybe Carl, I'll, I'll let you address if, if you'd like how the demand charge issue uh, plays out in, in, in your service territory. Certainly. So for, for those that don't know, I mean, demand charge is basically a way to recoup the cost of how big of a pipe we need, the utility needs to send to your facility. 
So if it's water, are you drinking from a straw or are we putting up big, con you know, the equivalent of big concrete conduit up there? Because those have different price points. So that's the purpose of the rate chart. The best way for any provider to limit the amount of demand charge as your bill is usage. The more usage you get, the more that demand charge gets thinner and thinner. Um, so what we do have in Austin Energy today, we do have what's called a demand charge floor. If you and what we saw with some of the first DC Fast Hubs, the first few months, they were getting a discount on demand charge because they're part of that floor. That floor was created, uh, ironically enough, uh, for um, artist community firing kilns to do clay work. So they would be, and they'd fire up these kilns and whatnot. It's like, well, you know, how can we support artists and whatnot? So it's kind of a niche, but it, it works for a lot of different business models. And so that's a way from day one, you'll get a discount, but looking at different customer bills who do DC fast with usage, good marketing, good product, they quickly uh, don't need that floor anymore because they now have the usages up. Uh, I also did mention a, a new tariff we're doing and that new tariff, um, has a lot more fixed components. The actual energy charge might be 0, 0.000. So it's really up to you to figure how that works. There's still some volumetric charging to the provider uh, to include what's called a regulatory charge, but those are very small. And there's also something called like a cap charge, which helps with energy efficiency program, but they're not nearly as close as a normal energy KWH charge. So once again, you can figure out your business model. So we want to drive behavior. Uh, and at some point, it can also encourage on-site storage solutions and whatnot. So that's another way some people are looking at it is on-site storage to cap demand charge. But I, I really think here in Austin, you're, you're, you're pretty good to set up the products we have today. And hopefully, we'll have a, a new specific tariff that even be more uh, exciting. Thanks. Mike, I don't know if you want to chime in at all. Yeah, for sure. So we we don't have any special tariff provisions around demand holidays or anything like that for for basically any customer classes at all. Um, BC Hydro has uh, had a rate recently approved um, targeted uh, around um, return to base fleets, I guess, or, or fleets electric fleets in particular, um, where there are some you know um, relaxation of those demand charges. So that's something we're looking at. I think you know historically we've heard from all our different customer groups, nobody likes demand charges, you know, whether, whether the artisans, like, like Carl mentioned, in, in our case, it's, it's some of the, um, the fruit packing facilities that are seasonal in nature. And there's been a concern of, you know, a bit of negative customer backlash if we were to make this exception for, for this growing market. And, and I think there's, there's a lot of good reasons why we, we ought to try to, to help grow EV charging. Um, so, you know, looking at what Hydro uh, has recently had approved here by the regulator and, and some of the customer feedback they received, you know, they had a ton of public support for what they were proposing. So I, I do think it's only a matter of time before we have some of those options, um, maybe not necessarily for public charging, but definitely for fleet charging uh, within our service territory. Today, the way our demand structure works is demand doesn't kick in until you're over 40 kilowatts. So when we're just looking at these small sites, you know, as a proportion of the overall bill for like a 50 kilowatt station, demand is really not that significant. But as we densify sites and, and we look at some of these Petro Canada and Electrify Canada sites that are, you know, half to a meg, um, yeah, demand is going to be a huge, huge part of the equation there. And I... I I was glad to hear Carl mention the on-site storage because I, I do think that is potentially part of the solution. You know, utility capacity itself to serve some of these large sites is is going to be constrained and potentially extremely expensive to upgrade. And you know, on-site storage to 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 uh, reduce those demand charges and shave those peaks might be the more cost-effective option, especially as battery prices come down here. Thanks, guys. That's that's very helpful, and I think a very a really topical. Uh, topical issue for many, many people. Um, we, I know we'd all love to be here for, for much longer, but uh, we've finished our time for today. And so I'm just going to uh, provide a quick closing. I, I, I really want to thank our guests today for spending some time sharing their insights into the deployment of DC fast charging infrastructure. Um, it was particular, particularly useful for me to, to, to see and consider some of the similarities and differences that can exist in, in both rural and urban de deployments. So your, your perspectives were uh, very much appreciated. I'd like to remind everyone that this is the second in a series of flow webinars and the next one is on uh, curbside charging deployments and takes place on uh, August 6th. You can find uh, a link to this webinar and other content on the flow website. And uh, with that, just like to 
say thank you everyone for attending and uh, we look forward to continuing uh, these important conversations uh, about EV charging with all of you. Thanks very much. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.